Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are now live. Uh, always some little technical issues, but we are happy now to be broadcasting this uh, seminar ahead of the Stockholm Plus 50 conference. My name is Anna Sundström, and I am the Secretary General of the Olaf Palme International Center. Our climate and natural world are on the brink of collapse. At the same time, global inequality is soaring and the fight for decent working conditions and workers' right to organize is still ongoing. These two crises, the planetary crisis and the inequality crisis, are closely linked. A radical climate transition is necessary, but how can we make sure that the rights of workers and communities around the world are protected during this great shift. So the question is, how can we make sure that the transition is not only uh, uh, just, but it is that uh, also a just transition. So uh, with us to discuss this today, we have a panel of very uh, interesting guests and uh, we are also very happy and honored to have a, a very uh, important and also experienced uh, moderator to discuss this topic with us today. So with this, I would like to give the floor to uh, you, Gjuteland, a uh, member of the European Parliament for the Social Democratic Party of Sweden, uh, to take us along and to moderate this seminar. Okay, so uh, let's see. It seems as if Jutte might have some problems uh, to log on. Uh, if she could uh, just try to make sure uh, to put her camera on, and uh, we will, uh, as soon as possible, of course, give her uh, the word. I'll also see if uh, I can get a, a, a small little sign from from our technicians uh, when she has uh, joined us. Um, so we all, well, Sweet Stockholm and also, of course, the world is now preparing for the Stockholm Plus 50 conference. We know that uh, the world will gather here in Stockholm to uh, discuss how to tackle the necessary transition uh, beginning of June, the 2nd and 3rd of June, and Olaf Palme International Center will be hosting a series of, of webinars uh, leading up to this uh, conference. And this is the first uh, of three. I will come back to that uh, also rounding up this seminar and, of course, invite you to take part in the other two seminars. But with this now, uh, please, Jutte Guteland, member of the European Parliament for the Swedish Social Democratic Party, guide us along uh, this seminar and also present to us uh, our panel. And now you disappeared again. We could see you, but it went black, unfortunately. Okay, so I'll then take the opportunity now to invite you to also the two, two upcoming uh, seminars in this uh, series of, of webinars leading up to the Stockholm Plus 50 conference that the Olaf Palme International Center will host today, as you know, uh, on, on just transition. We will also have a discussion on ecocide 
and the importance to strengthen international law in order to well protect our environment of course uh, but also to make sure uh, that profit is is not uh, uh, due to or, or at the at the cost no. or the expense of of climate and and our nature. And finally, we will also okay. discuss common security. But now again, we can see you with the, and also hear you. So with this, please uh, welcome, and the floor is yours. I'm so sorry, Anna, and I'm. It's such a privilege to be here and. Um, um, we are in the middle of the negotiations on the ETS system uh, in the European Parliament. Uh, so I was going uh, from that room and had some connection problems. Uh, I'm really sorry about that because I, re I wanted to participate as the moderator here today because I think the topic is one of the most crucial questions uh, to uh, actually uh, have in a webinar on the climate policy um, because without a just transition there is no uh, transition that is my absolute uh, conviction and i believe that for the climate ambition we need uh, to uh, make sure that we have uh, we are including uh, everyone and make the so society fair and i think also we have great panelists here today i'm very impressed by uh, by the panel, and um, uh, I would not uh, let uh, uh, take any time from you, but I would really like to hear from you uh, the first question that I think is relevant to this discussion. So, please, uh, to the whole panel, I would like uh, to uh, welcome all of you on. Uh, 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 I'm so sorry, Yuta, to come in. Uh, we actually can't hear you at all. Um... <sighs> Do you have problems to hear me? We hear oh you now. My... <laughs> yeah, so we, we didn't hear any when? of that. Um, since we started including everyone else. No, no, we, we heard the first part of your, your introduction. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Now I got really nervous here. Uh, okay, now now I think maybe for you, you can see this as uh, nothing can go wrong for you now. I've done all the mistakes in the beginning. So now we will have a very at ease discussion where you can feel free to to be able to uh, to answer my first question. And I, I'm not sure if you got it, but uh, I want to hear from the panel why you think it's so important that the urgent shift to fossil fu uh, free society is a just transition. Why, from your dimension, is it so important that uh, it is, uh, it is uh, that just for the workers and for the society? So uh, I, I think... Um, uh, we could uh, st start uh, by uh, uh, having the focus on the trade unions, maybe. Uh, and um, uh, Myrtle, you could start. And then I will hand over to Rhoda and then uh, Trasha and, uh, and then to Linda. So we take that order and I will not go in between. But you will have the same question here. Welcome. Okay, <laughs> good morning, uh, everybody. I have to say, first of all, you are throwing me in a very deep end because the question is actually, you know, it's very hard for domestic workers and the domestic sector 
uh, to understand because we have to understand that the labor laws, especially domestic workers, are very isolated. And we don't understand every day the changes that are taking place in this world. We also don't understand every day how this is affecting us all these health issues, all those things that is wrong in this world. We don't really get that when we suffer, we don't understand for us, it's just feeling sorry for ourselves. And now we have to understand, we have to enter into a world where we understand what is global warming. We have to understand the world just transition. And we have to understand and make sure that we know what is going to happen in the way forward. We know about all the harmful chemicals we know about all the things that are affecting ourselves. We also know about domestic workers that are working on farm areas, that are working the hard ground. We also know about domestic workers that have had to go far away to fetch water, and also the water is unhealthy and it's not safe. So there's a lot of things that we do know. We also know how education is affecting the domestic worker and their children because of job losses and things that are happening. Many times domestic workers have to take their children out of schools because they can't really afford the schooling. And we also have to look at the food. We have to look at how the food is produced. But we also have to look at the lack of food for domestic workers because you always find domestic workers work in homes. Domestic workers doesn't have access to good food. And also domestic workers often have to rely on food on the streets, which is not healthy. So a lot of things at the moment is challenging the domestic sector. And we have to find ways of how are we going to ensure that domestic workers themselves understand what is happening in the environment. We have to ensure how will domestic workers understand what is affecting them and how it's affecting them? And only if we can bring that across to the... And I'm talking about the labor movement, but I'm talking especially at the vulnerable sector. Because, you know, when things get discussed, you always find the vulnerable sector is at the bottom with no clue of understanding. So I think for us here, yeah, it's very important that we are part of this discussion today. It's also very important that we say and put our views of where do we see ourselves moving into this world that we are moving. A safe free world, free from the chemicals, free from all the harmful. And I think this is what I would, would like to bring across. Where do we see us? Where do we see domestic workers going to be part of, like they say, the economy? You know, they always say domestic workers doesn't understand the economy. But I'm sure that if we really, you know, open up and we really talk about it. So I think this is what I will see. And I think that, you know, we, we also find ourselves living in homes next to dumping sites because there is no proper housing for domestic workers or for the, for the vulnerable workers. So often you find your children actually stripped getting into this dumping site, which is where the waste of everybody. You also find yourself behind the closed doors where you work with the waste of the very household. You find yourself sometimes working in unhygienic circumstances because the employers don't provide for your gloves and things. And you find yourself working with harmful, strong chemicals in the house. And that often leads to asthma attacks and affecting your health. But because we are not clear of all this, because we are still so blank and not understanding and why this is affecting us, not understanding the environment and not understanding what's happening there. I think this is what now must change. And we have to make sure that when we have this big stock, and we have to make sure that we will be involved in the decision making and that we will be involved in taking control of our own health and our way forward. Thanks. Thank you so much, Myrtle, for that uh, very interesting intervention, both giving us uh, the importance of uh, and uh, the facts of how people's lives look like and also uh, giving into this discussion uh, your uh, view and important uh, facts about the chemicals also. Um, and uh, with no further ado, I would like to hand over to Rhoda and maybe we will get uh, also now the focus on the workers um, in the Global South. And the floor is yours also for three minutes.
Thank you so much, guys, and thank you to all the organizers uh, for putting this together and definitely for bringing the ITUC on board. Um, um, I, I would just want to share the perspective from a global south where, um, as we all know, um, the global south is characterized by high informal economy levels, high levels of unemployment, um, high decent, in, in, um, decent work deficits, um, high inequality levels, etc. And so how do we ensure that whilst we are transitioning um, to a green economy, um, these issues are properly catered for, or these issues are properly taken account of. How do we ensure that the transition response to these deficits in the economy, these deficits in the society are heavily impacted, would to enjoy the benefits of the new economy that we envision. This is why we think that it's important that in transitioning or designing a transition, um, um, all partners or all stakeholders are brought on board. So the question of consultative social dialogue process cannot be compromised. We have to ensure that workers, employers, governments, community members are all parts of the design of the kind of economy we're envisioning. And um, it's important that all stakeholders are at the table from the very beginning where we are planning um, just transition processes in our countries so that they are not only brought on board at the implementation level where their concerns probably were not catered for or taken into account at the beginning. And so social dialogue for us is key. Um, however, we also have social deficits where um, workers as well as um, 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 but marginalized populations do not have the benefits of being part of processes. And so this is why we are saying that in the transition process, whilst we envision um, a, a green economy, we have to take this on board, that the, consult, that, that the process is consultative enough that everyone is able to be at the table. We are also saying that it's important that the transition delivers green jobs, that we are not going to transition at the expense of workers who have, who, 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 who contribute so much to the economy, but um, actually benefit very minimally to, to profits and benefits. And so the transition has to deliver decent and green jobs, jobs that provide living wages, jobs that are able to meet decent working conditions for workers and for their families. It's also important that while we move towards a green economy, that this transition responds to questions around inequalities in society, questions around inequality that is perpetrated against women, um, different groups, indigenous groups, marginalized groups in the communities, in, in, in our populations are taken on board so that we have a fair and inclusive MB. And so generally we see that the, 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 the whole transition process is an opportunity to respond to some of these deficits that we see in our economies, in our societies, in the global south. And this is why we say it's important for all st stakeholders to be on board. Lastly, it's also important that we look at the kind of investment that we, we embark on when we, when, when we design the transition. And for labor and for trade unions, we're saying that it's important for us to invest um, in ways that will not be detrimental to people that have not contributed so much to emissions. And so here the questions about um, Global South and Global North also comes to play. Questions around communities, questions around countries that have historically contributed um, to global carbon emissions should provide supports to countries that are vulnerable to climate impacts but perhaps do not have the capacities to um, adapt and to also and to also respond to and to build resilience. And so questions around justice, equity are very key when it comes to the whole transition process. Um, I'll stop here and hope that I get the opportunity to come back to speak to some other points. Thank you. Thank you, Rhoda, and thank you also for uh, contributing to the discussion with the perspective of fairness. Uh, very timely discussion uh, has uh, also been highly debated in the last uh, COP in Glasgow and uh, something that I think uh, we really need to listen to um, and also on the perspective uh, on, um, on how uh, 
different populations in countries are affected and in, not in relation to who actually emitted the most. Um, then uh, uh, I would like to hand over to uh, Trusha, who will, uh, I think, also uh, give us some perspective on uh, gender dimension, but uh, uh, also answer to the big question. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, it's lovely to be here with you all. Um, thank you so much for including Woman African Alliance into this conversation and to including, by extension, I suppose, the perspectives of women and particularly sort of peasant and working class women in Africa into this conversation. Um, I don't pretend to... Um, I don't pretend to be <laughs> one of those uh, of the constituencies, but I certainly work to try and support those women across the African continent, particularly looking at how we can support them to become more resilient and to adapt to the the, the climate um, to the, the the yeah to the climate crisis and to to ensure that there is an absolutely a just transition. And so I think. Like the others have said, the other panelists, uh, justice is really key here because we really can't talk about a transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy, for example, but leave women and their communities behind. Um, what we've had in our current development model, as we know, where fossil fuels is dominant, is that we have uh, an energy system, for example, um, uh, powered by fossil fuels that really provides energy only to industry and to the elite in our society. And if we have a renewable energy system that we transition to that continues to perpetuate that injustice, that, that there isn't energy access, there isn't energy justice for women and their communities, then we really, really can't be thinking about this transition in a very just way. Uh, and so justice really is key in this transition as far as we see it. I think the issue is also that um, women, particularly sort of peasant women farmers and working class women, as I've said, in, in regions like Africa, where I'm based, are really those that are most impacted or will be most impacted by the climate crisis. Um, and yet they're also sort of um, impacted by the current development model, uh, which we need to transition away from. So as we think about transitioning, we need to consider how to bring them in how to bring them forward and be able to start actually injecting these ideas of not just access but justice uh, in, in this transition as well. Um, I think we need to consider that uh, they have fair uh, and equal access to uh, the resources that they need to be able to live sustainably, to live a prosperous, a good life. Um, and so the transition has to really consider all of this. It, a narrow idea of a transition that just goes from dirty to clean, um, we don't believe uh, will actually be fair and equitable and, and, and right, I guess. For, for all of the people um, living in places like Africa and other parts of the global south, particularly. Um, I'll leave it there for now, thanks. Thank you, Trasha, and thank you for this uh, extremely important perspective. Uh, I myself got uh, some thoughts on it, uh, on, the, on the fact that 60% um, of, uh, of the farmers are, um, uh, who, who needs the soil and the, the climate to be uh, like it has been are women. And uh, there are definitely uh, women who will be mostly affected uh, by the change. And already we see that. So uh, this needs to be much more highlighted in the conversation. Uh, then I would like to inv uh, in invite uh, Linda uh, to, to give your... Um, introduction here on this uh, question and maybe again on the on the workers perspective and uh, a little bit from a eu perspective uh, eu country uh, linda the floors are yours is yours uh, yeah thank you very much and first of all i would like to take the opportunity of course to thank you for inviting me to this very important webinar uh, but i will continue speaking swedish uh, there is an interpreter who will uh, who will uh, speak English for me today. So I will go to Swedish now. Um, 
som fackförbund så skulle jag säga att det korta svaret på frågan varför det här är viktigt är att det finns inga jobb på en död planet. So as on behalf of the union, unionist, I would like to say to this question, well, the short answers are that there are no good jobs on a dead planet. That is the first answer. Och vi jobbar ju för jämlikhet på, på bred front och det innebär ju såklart att vi även jobbar med det vad det gäller klimatomställningen. Det kräver... Mm. And we work with uh, equality, but on a very broad front, wide front, and that also means, of course, that we're working with the climate transition. För eh, vi ser ju det. Det är viktigt med rättvis omställning som inte lämnar någon bakom, mm. eh, och det tror vi krävs reformer för omställning som just ger möjligheter för alla att hänga med. And so, yes, we really are working and see the importance of the just transition and making sure that nobody is left behind for that you really need to undertake reforms to ensure that everybody can be a part of this. Mm. Så eh, som fackförbund så har vi jobbat med klimat- och miljöfrågan sedan 2016 och har tagit fram ett eh, miljö- och klimatpolitiskt program för just att jobba med hur, hur kan vi som fackförbund se till att jobba för att ändra vårt köpbeteende till exempel. Och mm. vad kan handeln göra för att minska utsläppen? Mm. So uh, as a union, well we have been working actually with this uh, climate environmental program uh, since 2016. We've been working very much with this and we have brought out this program Uh, regarding the environment and climate and uh, uh, policy programs so to really see what we can do from the union to have an effect on the uh, patterns of uh, purchasing and, uh, and also how the commerce and trade can have a, a, a positive effect on this. Mm. Och man kan väl säga, vi, vi konstaterar helt enkelt att det här är någonting som vi behöver göra tillsammans. Det är inte var och en som behöver göra det utan vi behöver ha ett, ett brett arbete och det ska inte heller vara en klassfråga för om man kan göra hållbara val. Mm. And uh, this is something that we see that is necessary to work together on this. This is not something that can be done on an individual basis. No, it's a very broad work that needs to be done. And it should not be a matter of uh, what social class you belong to in order to be able to make sustainable choices. Thank you, Linda. And uh, thank you also for putting that uh, uh, dimension into this uh, uh, discussion and uh, on on the, the economic uh, classes and the differences between workers and uh, uh, how this transition will uh, will impact uh, different income groups and also depending on what kind of work you have. So really also interesting and important. Uh, we will have to uh, have a little bit shorter intervention and I will also not go in between to to, to complement your excellent interventions in the next round, uh, but I will let you speak more uh, freely and, and uh, give more room for you. Uh, so the, I have a new question for you on the topic, but uh, let's uh, stay two minutes each uh, on, on answering it. Uh, I think it would be very interesting to hear all of you uh, also on the dimension on the uh, gender And uh, often when we speak about the transition, uh, we speak about it in a very male dominated uh, way. Uh, so we speak about uh, construction, we speak about uh, energy, uh, transport, often male dominated uh, working places. And in the just transition, there is also more talks about how to help Uh, workers uh, in classic male uh, dominant uh, areas, how we can help the transition also economically. But how about the women? And uh, what shall we do here to make sure that the 
the women get compensated and that uh, this transition is beneficial for the women. Uh, and uh, as our uh, economies are fundamentally changed to meet the crisis, uh, how do we really seize this opportunity that is also is to change to a more fair uh, situation for women on the labor market? Uh, this is a question I would like you all to to answer. But if you feel that uh, you can do it short, uh, please do so, so we can also have room for the other questions. Uh, but I will do the same order. So, uh, Myrtle, you will have the first uh, intervention, and then we will go to Rhoda. Yeah. Okay. Again, me first. <laughs> okay, what I would like to say is that, yes, what you were saying, when we talk about just transition, we talk about the male-dominated world, we talk about construction and something, and we don't seem to think that women are also involved in this climate change that's affecting them. Because what we see is that most women, and I'm now I'm talking about women on, 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 on our level, the vulnerable workers, are involved in the informal sector which means they work in the informal communities and they are mostly, you know, there, which means their voices are never count. They never come out to speak how they feel they are affected. Just the instance, if we look now, what has happened in Durban? If we look at the current housing, the, the, the crisis, you know, what happened, the flooding, and we happen and we see our houses. And, and if we look clearly at it, we will see it is the most vulnerable workers that was affected by the, the actual flooding because it was the vulnerable workers that have houses that were standing just ready for the disaster. And that is what happened in the Durban now. It was women and women in the formal economies. If we look at farming, we look at the poor woman that is working on the farms. It is the poor woman that is actually working that hard soil. And then if we look further how it's affecting them, we find that on that farm there is no health, there is no water, there is nothing. So we're actually looking at how women is affected. If we look at, like they say, first of all, we look at all the things happening on the road, we see that it is actually affecting domestic workers, the way a woman, the way we travel and the way we are on the road and how we are, you know, assuming all these fuels that's on this road. But it's the vulnerable workers and our role is we have to be part of society. And therefore, because we are in the informal workshop, our contribution is never taken seriously. It is never discussed. It is always put as just the issue that is there because, oh, well, it's just women and it's male dominated. And I think the time has come now for us. The time has come for us to say to ourselves, we want to be part of all of these discussions. We want to learn about it. And how can we do it? We have to ensure that women are represented at the stocks. We have to ensure that women, vulnerable women, are seen in a leadership role to understand what is affecting them. And then for us, just transition means, yes, we want to move into a new way. Yes, we want to move to a green society. Yes, we want to move into a, you know, a safe environment. But for us, we have to get rid of all of that that is still blocking us. And we have to stand up as women and we have to make our voices heard. And only if we can do that, only if we can ensure that we get a say, we can see that we are part of creating a healthy environment for all workers. And I'm speaking especially about the domestic sector. And that is how I see we have to become part of society. We have to be respected. We have to make sure that we stay in safe environments and that we have access to safe, healthy conditions. And that is the way I see it. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the passion. Uh, now uh, I will be very quick here and hand over to Rhoda that will also give your two minutes on this important right. and topic I will that try, you could I will, probably speak a long time. Yes, I, I will try to be quick. And um, just to start by saying, a colleague of mine once said that being, woman, being a woman in Africa is already a triple threat. 
Um, and this actually means that, first of all, you're black. Secondly, you're a woman. You're ma you, 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 you fall under marginalized and marginalized uh, population. And, third, and, and thirdly, yes, you are, well, so you're black, you're, you're a woman, and then um, you're from a developing, you're from the South. And um, this, I mean, as much as may sound very, um, very, um, uh, like a cliche, is actually the reality of many women in Africa and, and the developing South in general. And how are we going to ensure that the concerns or these kind of concerns are taken on board in the in 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 a, in a, in a way that is um, beneficial to these groups of people? It's also important for us to note that women, at the same time, are the bedrock of societies of many. African economies or many many countries are the um, um, in general not just in Africa. Um, when you take the agricultural sector, for instance, women are found in the, in, in farming and subsistence farming. They produce and, and they produce and contribute to high um, to 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 um, food security in the in the in the in the society or in our countries. Um, however, this um, this population is highly marginalized and actually faces a lot of um, indecent conditions when it comes to work, when it comes to income inequalities, um, when it comes to um, gender wage gaps, etc. And so the point is that whilst we envision or move towards creating um, um, a just transition, we have to ensure that these concerns are taken on board so that this population that is so important and contributes so much to the overall um, economy um, of, of, of the world actually benefit to um, or actually share or have a, um, have a, have a, a, a part in, um, in, in, in the benefits of society. And how do we think this can be done? It's important, first of all, and I think Martel mentioned this, representation is key. Whilst we transition or whilst we design and create the kind of transition we envision, it's important for women to be represented in decision-making structures um, across board. Women have to be present to be able to share their concerns, to be able to um, um, and put, put across whatever they want um, to see in these kind of new um, um, economies that we envision. It's also important that um, there's investment in, 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 um, in, in care work, for instance, which, is a, um, which contributes greatly to um, global economies, but which is very much undermined. And so how do we ensure that investment is, is placed in care work? How do we also ensure that there are adequate social protection um, provisions for women. And so we have to ensure that, yes, the kind of economies we build now actually caters for um, questions or response to, to, to question, social protection deficits such as health, um, um, education, etc., which women oftentimes are the ones that um, fall prey to and do not benefit very much to. And so um, it's, it's more so important now that women are um, capacitated, are um, provided with the adequate skills that are um, that would help them to be able to also assert themselves and also improve and um, improve their agencies to be able to contribute to the overall um, design of a sustainable a sustainable economy which has to be inclusive and this cannot be compromised. Thank you mo uh, so much for for that too, and uh, I will immediately uh, hand over now to. Uh, Trasha, and after that to Linda. Uh, the floor is yours. Thanks. So um, I would say at a very superficial level, uh, it is about bringing women, obviously, into the clean uh, economy uh, and being able to sort of have jobs uh, for women in the economy. But that's really a very superficial level. Um, you know, we at a deeper level need to ensure that, you know, women are able to own and take control over the resources that they need. And so we need sort of woman led solutions. Um, I guess the other issue for me, which I think Rhoda had touched on, is this issue about women's work. So I think you two, you were speaking about a more sort of male dominated work and female dominated work. But you know, women's work, according to patriarchal norms that we generally live by, is about a whole lot of things uh, like care, uh, but, but, you know, and care, including uh, not just taking care of um, the communities and the sick in their communities, but also about cleaning, about cooking, um, and so on. And um, 
and and in fact social reproduction as well which is about creating the next sort of uh the next generation of workers or even male workers um but all of this work that women do uh we we know in a patriarchal society is not valued it's not costed it's not actually even considered as real work and yet this is all of the work that they do on top of um you know everything else and so i think when we're talking about a just transition we really need to consider these issues as well so what is women's work as we know it right now and how do we transform this how do we uh, value this work how do we redistribute this work in a fair and equitable manner uh, so that it is not just women who are holding up society with all of these different other functions and and men and everybody else seems to just sort of reap the benefits from it and i think as a final point that just uh is sort of builds from that one about women's work and and how we how we look at it is that the burden of this so-called women's work that that we have today um is going to get more and more burdensome it's going to get more and more harsh as our climate and ecology changes um and there are more and more stresses uh on women um and so i think we need to consider that as well as we transition and and that they uh and this increased burden needs to be looked at as well and how we actually uh move this away from it being just women's work um and and how do we take care of that uh in a way that makes sense uh and that makes sense for an an actual just transition thanks thank you trasha and thank you also roda uh, for for that dimension i was thinking myself today i actually had this feeling of some tension to keep everything together with the kids with the work so you really spoke directly to my heart there and uh, i know many women all over and then when you put the economy on that uh, and the unfair economy that's definitely a very big message um then i would like to hand over to linda for this uh, uh important uh, uh topic uh, so the floors are your is yours tack så mycket eh, jag representerar ju ett fackförbund som eh, har en en majoritet av medlemmarna är kvinnor och eh, därför blir det ju naturligt att när vi när vi jobbar med klimatfrågan så hänger det också ihop med eh, kvinnors arbetsvillkor naturligtvis Mm. Yes, I uh, well, I am from a union that I work with. The majority of our members are women, and so naturally, then we also work with these matters, and it's all connected then to the climate climate issue. Mm. <clears throat> när vi frågar eh, våra medlemmar vad de ser som det största hindret för att engagera sig mer i klimatfrågan. Då uppger de faktiskt att det handlar om underbemanning på arbetsplatsen. Det handlar om att man jobbar deltid. Eh, och det handlar också om att man har otrygga anställningar. Mm. And when we ask the, our, then the women or we ask our members, what are the major impediments or hindrances for them to become more involved in, with the climate? And uh, they say, well, it's because they are understaffed many times, it's a lack of personnel, or they're working part time, and also that they have a lot of other commitments and yeah, other commitments. Mm -hmm. So slutsatsen som vi drar. Det är ju naturligtvis att om vi förbättrar arbetsvillkoren för våra medlemmar på arbetsmarknaden så kommer det gynna en snabb och rättvis klimatomställning. Därför att, och då gynnar det också såklart kvinnors arbetsvillkor. Men därför att det kommer vara fler som också kommer att, att kunna engagera sig i omställningen. So our conclusion then is that if then the work conditions uh, improve, then it will be possible quicker um, to be able to uh, have a, 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 have justice. And because if there's better work conditions, then more people will be able, more women will be able to become involved with a just transition. Okay. 
thank you and uh, you uh, coming from from the same country i know that this is the work that you do on a daily basis this very integrated way of uh, of tackling this question i would like now uh, to get some perspective in uh, with two questions, actually, I put them together so you can choose a little bit uh, what you think is the most relevant from you and the panel. Um, both a question that I know uh, Palmer Center wanted us to uh, to talk about, and uh, that is uh, the conversation uh, conversation on the just transition focus many times uh, on the shift to the fossil free. Um, uh, economy and society. But if we look uh, on the global perspective, uh, which action do we need from the uh, from the global north to guarantee um, the just transition for the global south? Uh, and you have touched upon it a couple of times, but uh, if you like to kind of give that last message here, do that. And that also goes into the final question. So I put them together to make it easier for you and us and to be in time. Uh, so the final question uh, that I would like you to, to give is actually advice uh, for the Stockholm 50 conference uh, so that um, this environmental conference can uh, can conclude or, or give the result that's uh, important for the just transition. So what would you like to see from that conference to make sure that uh, the actions uh, that uh, is taken on environment and human rights are good ones for the just transition? So if you could pick and choose a bit between these two questions or integrate them uh, and uh, and then uh, the floor is yours for two minutes each uh, to to conclude in that way. Uh, then I know we had an interesting question uh, also uh, in the chat and that would be uh, what should be the concrete role input for workers, women, small farmers, indigenous people in decision making on energy. Uh, transition uh, so if any of you like to answer to that one meanwhile maybe there will be another one from the chat that we can conclude uh, after your interventions so we get come we go with the same order uh, and i will not hop uh, i will not jump in between because i take time from you and i don't want to do that because you say interesting things so i want to listen to you so we learn the order now so welcome all of you in order that we have learned during this conversation i think that um I would not so much focus on the question three. I would like to focus on where we're going to and, and with the, the conference that will take place. And for me, it would be that we need to, we, we actually need to center more on decent work. And we also, we cannot talk about environment issues without involving the people within that environment. Otherwise, it's not going to make sense. And that is what I would like to see that will take place at this conference. Also, because we have to understand that the environment infects mostly the vulnerable workers. And we always find at this conference, it's always the words of those people that's in control, but you never find the actual, you know, contribution and the people that's involved on the ground level. So for us, if we want to move in a just transition way forward, and we want to move to a greener like economy and things like that, we have to make sure that those workers that is not clear on what's happening in the world and those workers that don't understand what is all this high work that we are using that we have educating them so when their voices we cannot decide for people up there and we don't know what is actually happening on the ground and for me i would like to end with what the pope has said is always in my mind the pope is saying that the planet is our house yes and the planet as humans, we take care of the planet. But as domestic workers, we take care of the homes. So why is it that that three can't work together? Why is it that we can't lift our voices from the homes to the environment and to as human beings? So for me, I would love to know that 
our voice is going to be it, and that we will enter into a green economy, we will enter where jobs is available, we will enter where we have decent lives, where our children can enjoy schools, where we are actually free to actually speak. And that is what I would like for the future and what I would like to say about the domestic sector. I like we always say, our world can only be free if domestic workers are free and take their place in society. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, I think my role is there to sneak in a little bit quick just to say that uh, you gave us the image, the uh, show the, um, with your uh, um, showing with the home and how, how it fits together. Uh, I think that was really something that's uh, making you re think about the situation and how it really is. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for all the interventions. Maybe we will have a chat in the end, but otherwise I think you gave the conclusion uh, in a very good uh, final statement. So uh, I will uh, now hand over. Uh, and uh, I think the order that we had before was... Uh, uh, to give the floor to you, uh, Rhoda, and uh, and then uh, move on. Uh, I think we may have lost Rhoda. Then I will hand over to Trasha, and then we will see if she connects again. Sure. Thank you very much, Ita. Um So I think. Um, one of the foundational issues, I think, um, that should really sort of help us with our understandings of the just transition um, is the idea of climate justice uh, and the understanding that it is the global north that has caused the climate crisis um, and therefore owes a climate debt to the global south. So in talking about what the global north needs to do, I think this is one really big foundational issue. Um, we need climate justice in the just transition, and we need a climate debt that is paid by the global north to the global south to be able to be more resilient to the, cli to, uh, the climate change and climate change impact, sorry, and to be able to adapt to climate change. That climate debt can be paid in many ways. Most people think of it as climate finance that needs to be transferred from the north to the south to be able to transition. Uh, we can also think of it as transfer of technology, but there's a huge amount of reparations that need to be paid also for the injury that has been done on the lands of uh, people in the global south. Um, I think there's a couple of other things that we need to consider as well. I think when we talk about solutions uh, to the climate and ecological crisis and the just transition, we also need, and, and the responsibility of the global north, I think we need to consider um, very seriously that we need, that the global north needs to mitigate as the first priority, which means no new fossil fuels. It means a rapid phase out of fossil fuels. Um, it means the, the decrease, I mean, also just um, sort of the reduction of all kinds of other um, harms that have been caused uh, in terms of increasing carbon emissions in the atmosphere. Um, and it means real solutions, not net zero solutions, not false solutions, but real solutions that will actually decrease the carbon in our atmosphere and really be able to take care of climate change. We also need to ensure that consumption levels in the global north, but also elites in the global south, we know, needs to decrease rapidly uh, and urgently as well. We cannot be consuming in the way that we are. There is only uh, one planet, there's no planet B. Um, and so I think that we need to, to start conserving resources, using them uh, in, in a sustainable way. Um, and, and we also need to ensure that um, 
maybe as my last point, which is probably a bit of a controversial one, but we need to ensure that the new so-called green economy is not mimicking or is not similar to or replicating the fossil fuel economy that we have. So this idea of this new wave of green extractivism that is going to support a green energy revolution, we need to really consider this and who we're sacrificing in the process that we do this. And the fact that this rapid and large-scale extraction is going to still land us in the same problems that we've had as in the fossil fuel or the modern economy as well. So I think those are some, some thoughts, headline thoughts about what can be done by the mm -hmm. global north. Um, but it's obviously not exhaustive. But I think that that should help us um, with some, like I say, foundational pieces to lead us into the just transition. Thank you. Thank you, Trasha. You really spoke to the European Parliament now, I think. And I'm in the European Parliament. Uh, it was really like a message uh, to all of us. Uh, I think uh, that was really uh, appreciated. Linda, before I go to you, uh, um, I would also like to hand in... Um, and maybe that would have been good also for, for all of you. But I got in the chat uh, also the question on the men. Uh, but I think uh, I, will, I will ask uh, Linda also if, if you like to say something on that uh, together. Uh, it was uh, the men. We talk a lot about the women, but uh, let's talk about uh, the men. Not like they are in the center because they are always a bit in the center, but uh, more like... Uh, why uh, do we need the change? How can we go from the, the ego perspective to the ecological uh, masculinity? Uh, and, and that is something that maybe Linda can give us some thoughts on. Uh, the floor is yours, Linda. Tack så mycket. Uh, ja, men vi, vad det gäller män så kan jag väl säga att vi jobbar ju med de här frågorna oavsett kön. Alltså det här är både viktigt för män och kvinnor. Och det innebär att våra medlemmar, ja, de är både män och kvinnor och vi har ett stort engagemang även bland våra män. Så att det finns ett engagemang även ibland dem och vi tar tillvara på allt engagemang. Mm. Thank you. Well, uh, first of all I want to say that uh, we uh, work well with this. I mean, we have our members, they are both men and women. And I actually have to say that men and women, they are both uh, genders are actually very involved with this. So there's a lot, large involvement also among men. And these are matters that we are working with. Mm -hmm. Men, men som sagt, för att åstadkomma en rättvis klimatomställning så behöver vi ju använda vår gemensamma styrka, såklart. Och... Eh, jag skulle ändå vilja bara kort nämna att vi har ju faktiskt tillsammans med Palmecentret så har Handels också varit delaktig i att skapa en, den kallas för Broad National Alliance for Just Transition. Och det handlar just om så här, hur kan vi tillsammans jobba med eh, den här frågan framåt. Mm. And, uh, but of course in order to reach a just transition we need to be united we need to work together and i want to also mention also that uh, from uh, our union we are working together with the uh, palme center on uh, it's called a this joint project a broad national to working towards a broad national just transition to see how together how we can reach this för det, det som jag tror är så viktigt med när vi pratar om klimatfrågan det är en bred och folklig förankring så att, så att alla känner sig delaktiga men inte skuldbeläggning och skam utan att man känner att det här är någonting som, som vi alla kan vara med i och göra förbättringar. Mm. And, but I, I also believe that when we are working and talking about these uh, climate matters, it's very important to really have this, uh, to be accepted, to be ingrained in, in, in people, in a popular le level, to everyone to feel that they can be a part of this and want to be a part of it. But at the same time, we should not be blame, and people should, we should not be putting blame on anybody. Instead, it would be something that everybody wants to and feel that they want to be a part of. Och där, där tror jag att vi kan inte heller förlita oss på 
att det blir en rättvis omställning om vi tror att det här är en fråga för varje enskild individ. Utan det, det krävs betydligt större svar. Alltså det krävs svar från samhället, ifrån vad vi kan göra gemensamt. Både företag, civilsamhälle och politiken. Så att, ja, vi, vi tror att det är de strukturella förändringarna som kommer att ge de stora och långvariga effekterna. So, um, yeah, so I mean, we, we, if in order to obtain the, um, this just transition, I believe we cannot be sort of based, basing this on individual acts. No, this needs really to be something larger. Together we need to do. So they're involving also companies and uh, civil society. It has to be at a political level because it needs to be done in a structured manner in order to really achieve a change. Thank you. Last very important words on the importance on the structural change. And I think we can all agree on that. And I must say that it was an excellent panel. I'm sorry that Roda, Roda was uh, disappearing in the end here. Uh, we, we thank her also. I would like to thank the whole panel and I will hand over to Anna Sundström, uh, our Secretary General of uh, the Olof Palme International Center. And I would also take this opportunity to say thank you uh, to you who organized this. Uh, OPC is um, extremely important in uh, facilitating these important global discussions uh, on the global challenge that we have uh, ahead of us. And I think uh, I enjoyed this a lot. And I think hopefully that uh, many uh, were listening to your interesting intervention and discussion here today. Thank you once again from me. I will hand over to Anna. So you have uh, the opportunity to say the final words. Thank you so much, uh, Jutte, for taking part. I know that you snuck out of a meeting sitting in the corridor to be able to, to be with us today. And that is also, of course, uh, uh, sort of a proof of, of your very uh, strong commitment and personal dedication to this struggle. And it is a struggle that we, uh, of course, are in all of us. And I think the perspective on the need for it to be sort of rooted in lo local communities is also something that we take with us from this uh, discussion today. That has been really, really interesting. So thank you also uh, to, to, of course, the whole panel. And uh, it's just the beginning, right? This is also an issue that we will continue to discuss and we will, the next step will, of course, be to also uh, meet here in Stockholm and, and continue these discussions. And I think that uh, what Myrtle also said, that we cannot talk about the environment with also, uh, with, without including the people living in the environment, uh, is, is also a very strong message for us uh, to, take, uh, to take with us also for the upcoming discussions, of course, here in Stockholm. Uh, with this, thank you, everyone. This was, as I mentioned in the beginning, the first in a series of three webinars uh, that we as Olaf Palme Center are uh, conducting before uh, the Stockholm Plus 50 conference. The next one will take place on the 17th of May, focusing on ecocide, uh, stronger international regulation. For, for environmental uh, destruction or, well, to, to limit, uh, of course, environmental destruction. And then on the 31st of May, uh, we will also discuss the interlinkages between security and climate. So thank you again and uh, hope to see you on the 17th and the 31st. And then, of course, we will reconvene uh, in, in uh, Stockholm uh, beginning of June. Thank you, everyone.